We are live on Secrets of Success podcast, episode number five with Dr. Shane Needham. That's me, where our theme is never be outworked. Today, we will be talking about business and COVID-19. We have a great guest on the line who is my business colleague, my friend, and my mentor, Paul Kokorin. And before we get into that and have him introduce and me introduce and so on and so forth, this is our fifth episode, and we've had four episodes so far where we've had topics all the way from analytical testing for COVID-19 to, to faith in COVID-19 to um, what else have we had, to economy in COVID-19, and now we're going to talk about business and the economic um, and COVID-19. And, and what, what, what's great about Paul's perspective is he's from the New Jersey, New York area, and it's just been great. I've been talking to him. I talked to him a lot, but I've been talking to him the last couple of days, and Things are so different than in other places of the country. So we really can all learn from this. And we know there are challenges in the current environment where we're self-quarantined, we're isolated, and there's all kinds of things going on. Um, economically, some of us are shut down. And so, but there are also opportunities. And we have a great guest in Paul that is always, always optimistic and always has a great perspective on things and, and for the future. And so, so Paul, can you... Tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where you came from, um, how, you know, and we'll just let it flow from there. Well, Shane, thanks for having me on, first off. Uh, it's a, an honor to be um, brought into the program, uh, to connect with you, and to be able to share some thoughts and ideas uh, back and forth. Um, so to describe myself, I guess I would start with, uh, the word would be unconventional. Um, I've had what I would call an, an uncon unconventional upbringing. Um, I come from a pretty unique family. I'm the 12th of 13 siblings. Amazing. And so being at the end of the line, uh, I got uh, to the opportunity to observe a lot of things. So um, I grew up in a pretty traditional uh, Catholic household as a youngster. And um, my mom was a was very unique, and uh, she was a a nurse, but uh, went to college and received an RN and a, and a degree back in the 30s when that was fairly uncommon for a lot of women. And she obviously led a, uh, a you know quite a large clan, and was a very instrumental uh, person in our lives. When Paul uses the word clan, it truly means it because he's Irish. Yeah. <laughs> But um, so we've had, you know, I, I've had an unconventional uh, upbringing, but a really good one. So I had a whole lot of teachers in my life, a lot of mentors. And so I would say that um, is pretty unique in a lot of ways. And um, I've had a, a great opportunity through sports and activities like that to be exposed to a lot of great leaders and to learn a lot about teamwork and winning and losing and, um, and competing and uh, kind of getting back up and uh, taking chances. So um, I would, I had a little bit of a different path uh, than many, many of your other guests that you've had on yeah. um, and I've enjoyed it. I'm, you know, still having fun uh, working and um, going through the cycles and, and ups and downs of life and have enjoyed it. I'm, you know, kind of getting towards the latter part of my uh, business career. And so I've enjoyed mentoring and coaching. Um, I've coached a lot of basketball and baseball and uh, some different sports like that. And, um, you know, I have a great family. I have a wife and, and four kids. Uh, live out in the western uh, part of New Jersey, uh, which is a bit more rural than what most people may be familiar with if they're thinking of New York City and Newark and uh, busy turnpikes and, and oil tanks. Uh, where I am is, is actually very rural, uh, similar to where you are. Yeah. So um, um, anyway, that's a little bit of my background. And oh. so, so Paul, tell us about, um, so Paul is also president and CEO of McKinley Scientific. And tell us about, and you can tell us about McKinley Capital as well. Tell us about 
what you do, and he's, he's owner as well. And so tell us about what you guys do and give us an idea of the industries that you support because we're going to be talking about some of those industries today. Well, well, uh, thanks, Shane. Um, well, McKinley Scientific is a 20-year-old company. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my business background, uh, which kind of led to, uh, to McKinley Scientific. But I've always been in the high technology sector. Uh, believe it or not, back when teletype was cutting edge technology and I had brown hair. Uh, but I've, I, I worked for, uh, for Siemens Corporation, which is kind of the, uh, the general electric of the rest of the world, if you will. And I worked in their data communications division. I had a great mentor and a boss by the name of Mike McCourt, who uh, uh, taught me a ton and encouraged me and gave me confidence. And, uh, and I enjoyed technology and I enjoyed interacting with and, and selling to people and providing products and services. Um, then I went to work for a company called Cable and Wireless, which uh, had a division that um, made IBM plug compatible products. So I moved more into the mainframe computing arena and had a lot of exposure and some success there. Um, and, and then- who are, your, who are your customers and where were you traveling to? Were you, you know, to give a perspective to everybody across the globe, were you dealing with people on Wall Street? Were you dealing with corporations on Wall Street? Um, restaurants, what, what were you dealing with? Back in those days, I was more in the marketing and selling side. So I was dealing with end user opportunities uh, in the Northeast, uh, probably from, you know, maybe Washington, D.C., up through Boston. Uh, I dealt with companies like I worked with, you know, companies like General Electric and uh, larger uh, communications and data firms, you know, at that time. I did training in various other parts of the country, but I didn't travel a great deal outside of my own space. Um, and then a, a few years later, I, um, again, another mentor and friend uh, by the name of uh, Kevin McCormick uh, hired me uh, at a company called Computer Leasing Inc. where um, all of the principals at McKinley Scientific are, are from there at, at, at various points. And, um, so I learned a lot about the mainframe computer business, uh, global trading, asset management, uh, managing large portfolios of computer that had asset risk in terms of their residual value, their uh, fluidity, how do you raise capital to finance all that. It was a, a lot of exposure over a 12-year period. And I learned a lot of business skills there and met a lot of great people. Uh, then I was recruited several years later to um, help a company, a Fortune 500 company, a start a laboratory and scientific uh, asset management business. And I had a great opportunity to go work with this company, and I was there for a window of time and became uncomfortable with the process. But it was such a tremendous blessing because I learned so much about the scientific world, the analytical instrument world, the research space, and all of the various players and that market and how it worked globally. And I really enjoyed it. And I saw an opportunity to take the skills that we had in the mainframe and semiconductor business and apply them to science. And it was, and I thought it was a very underserved market and, and not particularly well understood. So I, I had signed a non-compete uh, contract. And so I left that company and I honored my non-compete and I went and worked on Wall Street uh, for 18 months in the uh, bond and capital markets, which again was another set of experiences that uh, proved to be helpful years later. Yeah. Uh, and then after that period of time, I got together with some former colleagues um, a gentleman by the name of Pete Koschel and Ken Satz, who you know, yep. and um, we they had a company called the McKinley Group, and I went to work for them for a short time, and then we decided to form McKinley Scientific. Um, at that time, Martin Steele, who you know as well, uh, was part of the organization, so we were four people, wow. and we started out in a one-room office. 
wow. uh, in 2000. And we looked at uh, various ways to serve the market space. And it's not too long after that that I think I met you. Yes, it uh, wasn't too long after that. And well, let me tell you a little bit about what, you know, to, to give you an idea of what Paul and McKinley Scientific and McKinley Capital do is they, so as you know, I own an analytical testing laboratory. And so we buy analytical instruments. We buy chromatography instruments and mass spectrometers and these are capital assets that can cost anywhere from, let's just start minimal, 40000 to four hundred dollars or $500,000, okay? Obviously, it's a very large capital cost. You have to get a return on investment, you know, use it enough and charge enough to your, your clients to make sure you can get a return on investment. And so what, what McKinley does is they take those assets and they – purchase them and then you can sometimes lease back from them or lease to own all different kinds of arrangements, whatever will suit your business model. And here's what I can tell you is that model was non-existent, almost non-existent until McKinley Scientific came into the industry and they really revolutionized how you actually manage your assets and your high level capital equipment like mass spectrometers and NMRs. And I know I'm using some terms that not everybody understands, but high level capital equipment that's very expensive, they made it more available in many different ways to many different types of people, whether they be startups or big pharma, for example. And so they really revolutionized and had it caused a paradigm shift that vendors um, the free market had to respond to. And so it's been, it's been really good. So thank you for that, Paul, and, and all the team, Ken and Martin and all the team at, at McKinley Scientific. So what, why don't you describe, I like to ha let, let our listeners know that all the relationships that I've ever had are very important to me. And I think about, so a lot of the people that I'm having on my, on my podcast, I have some, I knew them somehow, or I met them some way. And so Paul, do you remember when we first met and what would that story look like to you? If I remember correctly, Shane, I, I might think, not either. <laughs> I think we met at an ASMS conference, which is a large, uh, analytical, um, uh, chemistry and instrument conference that it's largely scientific based. So we were not a fish out of water, but we were definitely new to the game. And I think I, I think I was strolling the aisles and came across your company's booth. And, um, and we just started talking. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, I, I think that's how I remember it too. Although I thought we met at CPSA, but I wasn't, but, but I wasn't sure either. So which one it was. And, but. Well, we definitely met at CPSA, if not before, shortly thereafter okay maybe uh, that's what it was we had a, a common friend in mike lee yeah and and then we actually started working together on and doing some workshops and and yeah yeah Absolutely. communicating um Great. different ideas to a much smaller more intimate group of participants well, let me, let me tell you the first time. So the first time I met Paul and he already gave a great introduction of himself. And I think, I don't know what it is, but they call it the proximity pr principle. Okay. And I am, most people are attracted to the same types of people that they attract. And so I don't know what it is, but I just, there was something that connects me to certain people. And Paul was one of those. And he started talking about baseball. He is a, a Yankees diehard fan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's awesome. And that's a great organization. It just has a great history. And so, but we just started talking sports and fatherhood, um, business, all these different kind of things right away. And it was just like, wow, there's a connection there. And it was just like, that was our kind of our first conversation. I just, and I knew this guy had something special. And, you know, our theme on this podcast is never be outworked. And I just knew that might have been the connection. I just didn't know his story all the way. I only knew, you know, baseball and, he was a dad and all these different things and a business owner. So a lot of things in common is as me, but then I started hearing his story, you know, and you know, 13 siblings um, and his, his mom, he, he talks about his mom. And I think it's a great example that I don't think that, I don't think parents do this much anymore. Moms or dads. We're afraid to, I think uh, we, we want our kids to be our friends, but his mom, I remember him telling me, Something, I don't remember the exact details, but she pushed her kids hard. 
Mm. I mean, she wanted them to succeed and she got you up in the morning and she made you do certain things. And I was like, I like this guy. <laughs> and and you're, isn't it correct, Paul, your mom lived to be 100 years old, correct? My mom did. My mom passed away in 2014 on her, just after her 100th birthday. Wow. Uh, wow. So, uh, you know, her last few years were, you know, uh, she had various forms of dementia or Alzheimer's, whatever it was. And, um, but she did very, very well. Yeah. yeah. Or I think she drove till she was 94. Oh, um, yes. She was a very spirited woman. And um, uh, w- what I would say is uh, she definitely taught us self-reliance uh, as did our dad, um, but also interdependence. So, you know, I was thinking about this. I thought you might ask me about, my mom today a little bit. Um, But as it relates to today and things that are going on today, uh, the one thing that I would say about my mom is that she never panicked in a crisis. Wow. She was a true nurse in that sense. So if something happened to her kids or some bad event occurred or something happened at work, she never panicked in a crisis. And so that's a leadership skill, a natural leadership skill that she had that is very valuable today and that I think our healthcare and nursing and doctors and other ICU triage people that are working in the middle of this crisis right now should be very complimented for. Uh, Those that don't panic in these situations have a very good chance of coming through them successfully and calming everyone else. So uh, that's really one of the things I admire most about my mom. And I think that she kind of has been able to communicate to the people she worked with and her children and her grandchildren and, and so on and so forth. And she's inspired a number of people to go into the field. So that's uh, thank you for asking about her. That's a great story. So let's move on to business and COVID-19. Now, Paul shared this with me, and some of you may have seen this floating around on the internet or something, and I thought it was very appropriate. He shared it with me actually just this morning. So we, we, I'm going to share my screen here, um, see if I can do that, and I'm going to share a photo. There we go. Can you see that now, Paul? I can, yep. Okay, so, so hopefully everybody live can see this, and he shared this with me, and you probably have – have seen this uh, maybe floating around or not, but I think it's very appropriate to what we're going to be talking about today because you have three different camps of people with COVID-19 and it's okay to be all three. And there's people saying COVID-19 is, we're taking it very seriously. That's one camp. People worried about expansion of authoritarian government policies. That's another camp. People very concerned about impending economic devastation. That's another camp. And it's okay to be in those camps. And I, I want to do say I'm in the middle. And I understand, I I take it seriously. I'm also worried about economic impact. I'm also worried about government overreach. I'm all of those things. And so what I think is important is to listen to Paul's take today for you people that may be in not the area of New New Jersey or New York, listen to his take on what they are seeing in New Jersey and and, and New York and how it's different than maybe a rural area, maybe like I'm in, for example, in Idaho, or if you're in Nebraska, or maybe even Texas. So that is, I'm going to stop sharing that now, but there's those three groups, people who take COVID-19 very seriously, which we all should, economic devastation, and then over government overreach. So let's remember that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and we're back We're back to not sharing, and we're still being recorded, and we're, we're live. I want to point out to people that you can see this This is going to be compressed and compacted and edited. And it's going to be available probably next week. Like all, all my podcasts are, if you go to my website, drsneedham.com, they're online. We'll start actually rolling out those, my website more this week. And in the next coming weeks to do a more formal rollout. And also for my YouTube channel, it's on Spotify. It's also on SoundCloud. The podcasts are also on iTunes. So Paul, what, what, let's start there with that, sharing that screen and talk about what is happening in New Jersey and New York Metro. What, and I, we might not be able to comprehend that, so we'll listen and we'll learn. So what, what's happening there with COVID-19? A lot. Okay. So um, I, I think it's kind of hard to comprehend 
And I will say that where I live, which is just really 50 miles uh, due west of New York City, is very different than what it is 30 miles and closer. So you have two very different environments. Uh, and it is a very serious uh, situation. Uh, mostly, uh, I mean, Manhattan has an unbelievable amount of cases and, and the virus, as does Eastern New Jersey, which are the counties of Bergen, Hudson, Essex, that kind of border the Hudson River, which goes closer to New York, but it's throughout the state. But in those areas, the, uh, the, with the density that exists, and the healthcare system that is under great stress and the resources that are available for the concentration of a breakout like this, uh, everything is, is under duress and has been. I think that we are turning the corner um, regardless of where you are uh, uh, politically on different subjects. I think the governors have done uh, what they can and what they think is right in terms of responding to something that I think sprung on everybody uh, much more quickly and with greater impact than we than we thought. Um, but the hurdles have been enormous, the consequences have been great, and the response from people in general has been unbelievable. Well, it, so sorry, Paul, Paul, talk about, so Paul does live in a very rural area in New Jersey. I mean, actually, you, you see farms out there. There's some rolling hills. There's actually mountains. We probably call them hills, actually, if we're from the West, but they are. They call them mountains there, and that's okay. Um, but actually, your numbers that you were talking about in your county, actually, they were surprisingly high for me, what I thought was high. So describe your, your little, your small county and also the numbers that you've seen for COVID-19 and the deaths and so on and so forth. Talk about that. So we're up in the northwest corner of New Jersey. And uh, don't hold me to the exact numbers, but these are, are pretty accurate as of Saturday. Um, we have about 125,000 people in the county. Okay. And we've had, to date that I'm aware of, about 650 identified cases of COVID-19 and approximately uh, 65 uh, identified deaths or deaths labeled as COVID-19. Uh, what's interesting in our county is the, very, the vast majority of those are associated with the nursing care facilities, either people that are there or people that are working there. Uh, so that's a real big hotspot. Yeah. And it's been a hot spot at other nursing facilities and veterans facilities in New Jersey. Uh, one in Paramus, New Jersey had, I think, 17 uh, deaths in, in one particular site. Uh, that was, I, I think, about 10 days ago that was identified. So it's, it's very interesting that you have widespread and obviously dense areas like the cities and, and more uh, densely populated urban areas where the general population is is more widely affected um, and less so in more rural areas in the uh, northwestern part of New Jersey. Some of the southern parts of the state uh, more resemble maybe your area or some other rural areas, uh, but the concentrations in the eastern part are, are, are enormous. Interesting. Uh, so, so, and Paul, it is, I, I don't know the population of our county, it's called Latah County. I would suspect it's pretty close to the population of, is that Sparta County, Spartan County you guys are in? Or what is We're it? We're in Sussex County. It's called Sussex County, New Jersey. Sussex County. Okay. So, so uh, it, we might have about 125,000 in our county. I'm not sure. And it might be a little bit bigger county. I'm not larger land mass wise. And here are our numbers. Um, and these are interesting numbers. We have a really good local company that does economic impact assessments across the globe. They're amazing. And they're actually in Moscow, Idaho. They're called MZ, E-M-S-I. They're amazing. And so I assume there's where these numbers are coming from. Don't quote me on all of them, but I'm, I'm seeing this on social media and some other economic things. And so, but ours are, there are three cases in Lata County, zero deaths. Now here's the interesting part, economic impact wise, at least a $22 million hit to our local economy. And at least 3,000 jobs lost because we have had 
we have had a, a shutdown and our local leaders have said that we are quarantined until at least I think May 4th or May 5th. And that was done by our local city and, and county commissioners and so on and so forth. And so, and our, cause our state has actually separate rules that aren't quite go out to the to May, they more in the April timeframe. So, so it just, what, what I want to point out there is look at those dichotomies. We have three cases, zero deaths, 3,000 miles away in New Jersey. It's still a rural county where they're at, but it's closer to New York that they have 650 cases and, and 65 deaths. And, and so what we are seeing is what we don't know is we're going to see where this data goes because we, we're going to get a lot more data. Why, why is it in nursing homes? Why that seems like it's a concentration is because they're sick people because they're, is there elderly? We don't know. That, that data is going to come in and we'll know more about it. But just that's the dichotomy. So when somebody is sitting in their living room in the middle of Nebraska and they're in a town of 125 and they're saying, oh, this is nothing. Well, talk to somebody in New Jersey. Talk to somebody in Manhattan where they might be seeing some of these things. And so, Paul, I really appreciate your, your insights there. And so, so talk about the, the effects, not only in, your, in local New, New Jersey, wh what the govern, government has done, the governor or the states or whatever, how it's affected your industry. Go on, go on there. Not only restaurants and so on and so forth, but your industry. And the, the biotech industry that you support and this, the, you know, the analytical industry. Talk about that, too. Well, I, I think the way we do business is obviously going to change some. And I think our industry is going to be fine in the long run. Uh, everybody is suffering in the short term. And, you know, you're seeing it already. Everybody's becoming better skilled at Zoom or other types of media to communicate. Not because of COVID-19, but about a year and a half ago, we began to uh, go fiber optic with our uh, phones and communication systems and for, you know, company-wide. We're small companies, you know, uh, but we did a rollout over the last year so that um, we could communicate differently to broader market spaces and uh, to become more skilled at how we manage our media. The uh, benefit of that right now is that uh, our, our building's basically empty. We have a skeleton crew here to, uh, to keep things clean and to make sure that things are operating. Uh, I will come in periodically um, and, and make sure things are going okay, but we're all operating remotely. So we are able to conduct business. Uh, there's not a tremendous amount of business to be done, but we are able to serve people who uh, need us to help them uh, to finish projects maybe that had started to uh, go do a site visit if there's uh, something that broke that is going into a lab and obviously all of the security and uh, issues are done. So I'm not worried um, about me or our business or the company over the long term, our space, our industry. In fact, I think it's, you know, testing we know is going to expand more and more. Right. Um, so that's maybe a, uh, you know, a positive thing to be able to look at on a long-term level. Short term, it's, it's painful, um, but very manageable, I think. And I think there's a lot of companies that maybe are in that spot. What's concerning to me on a, on a national and global and certainly local levels are the businesses that are not necessarily able to adapt as easily and as quickly and the individuals and families that are going to be impacted by that. Can you describe some of those businesses, Paul? I know you've talked well, to- I mean, here, but... I, I'll give you, I'll use the restaurant industry for just a minute. Yeah. Okay, so we all, in all, all of our areas, we have restaurants and, uh, you know, we all like to go out and enjoy doing that and connecting and I'll talk about the, uh, you know, the social parts of, of all of this in a minute. But, you know, in New Jersey, restaurants are closed. Okay, bars are closed with the exception of takeout service. So the local pizza shop that's able to get a delivery system in place and to produce food and communicate to the market 
and at least sustain themselves by doing takeout, uh, you know, they have a chance to survive and to do okay and to rebound and maybe even earn some new customers and, um, you know, make something good out of something bad. Those that aren't to able to adapt or don't have the resources to do that, um, you know, that business cannot be made up. Right. Okay. Uh, I think I shared with you on the phone the other day, you're not going to buy 14 pizzas in June no. because you didn't buy any in February, March, April, and May. Right. Uh, that business is gone. But, but, and that's different than maybe the industries that, that Paul and I work in. Like a lot of things are on hold in the pharmaceutical and the biotech industry and, and the analytical equipment industry. A lot of things are just on hold. People are operating a skeleton crews. A, a lot of clinical studies are on hold and um, studies are on hold. And so, but those can come back, you know, and, and it's like you can double up on those, so to speak. But like Paul says, you're not going to order three times as many pizzas in June because you haven't ha had them for three months. You just, you don't get that revenue back. And, and, and I think you mentioned some other ones, Paul, um, the airline industries. You're well, not airline gonna, industries in a tough spot, you know, in a tough uh, spot. you know, very similar to nine 11. Um, yeah. And it, it worked its way back, but questions, you know, still remain, you know, we're not going to stop traveling. Right. That's true. Air yeah. travel is not going to stop. The need to travel is not going to stop, but it is going to change in my opinion. Yeah. And, and how much you do will probably change. Uh, certainly we're going to be doing more of this, what we're doing right now. We're going to communicate. Uh, there'll be less face-to-face -face meetings, uh, but you still need to have them. Absolutely. Uh, so, how people connect from a business point of view, how they conduct business is going to change. And um, in the midst of that, there's going to be a lot of opportunity. But let me come back for a second. I want to come back to this, but let me go back to a second for what, you know, some of the things that really concern me about, you know, the pizza shop example or the airline industry or anyone else that's been shut down. And, and that is down to the individual level or the family level. So what I'm worried about is are, are people that are, you know, have limited resources. Uh, maybe they're going paycheck to paycheck. Uh, maybe they have a couple of months of resources, whatever it is, but they lost their job. And they're gonna get a $1,200 or $2,400 check from the, from the government. And uh, which means they can pay the rent or the mortgage for a month or two, but not the food and not some of the other necessities of life and uh, not take care of their kids and the anxiety that that produces and the risk to other health factors. Uh, you know, we, we know that domestic violence is up. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about those stressors to uh, a lot of our uh, community that may or may not have the resources to, to deal with that. Yeah, so, you know, and I think that's a large part of our economy. Well, and you talked about um, domestic violence is up and so is suicide. I mean, a lot of people are depressed right now. And so, you know, there are some, I, I don't know if it's appropriate now, Paul, but one of, Paul has some great analogies and just great terms that are easy for me to remember. I need things that are easy to remember. One of them is about the uh, velocity of money. Can you, dis, can you describe the velocity of money, Paul? Can you describe that to people and how right. important that is in this current situation? Yeah, I'll try. I mean, I'm not an economist, but it's pretty much common sense uh, for all of us. But, um, you know, I was talking with my kids the other day and they're doing projects around the house and um, we're doing projects around the house. We're trying to keep people employed and, and, um, and activity going on and doing constructive things. Um, but my kids put a project together for themselves and they took some of the money that they had earned and they went and bought a bunch of materials, you know, at, at Lowe's and came back and started working on the project. And we were just sitting around the, uh, uh, the dinner table. And I said, do you guys kind of, you know, if, if you hadn't made some money here, would you still have gone out and spent that money on, on, on your project materials? And my son looked up, he says, yeah, yeah, I do it. I go, well, would you have enough money left over for other things? He says, probably not. And I said, well, I kind of, we started to talk about the economics of that and how the hundred bucks that you earned from labor here that you went and spent at Lowe's 
probably paid Lowe's for $40 worth of materials. And $60 were used that went to other people that work at Lowe's. And then that $60 went out the door and the person who left Lowe's stopped at that place where they're doing takeout now and they spent $20 on takeout. Okay. And then that $20 was used. Seven of that was used to, to pay for the materials to make the food. And the other $13 went to running the business and paying people and so forth. And maybe seven of that left and went to, we have quick checks out here, you know, which are like gas stations and convenience store, C store. Yeah. Convenience stores. And so that $7 went over to quick check yeah. to buy $5 worth of gas and $2, uh, a $2 coffee. And it all started with the, the $100 well, that somebody made. So and lost the example, I didn't even talk about the $40, what Lowe's did with that, and then what the people did with the rest of the money, but that's the velocity of money. Right. So that money moved five times, a velocity of five. And that is the central component of what shutting a global economy down does. It's exponential in its consequences. Yeah. So we are trying to continue with projects, the ones that we can, both legally and safely. Uh, you know, what projects we had laid out early in the year that we wanted to do around the home, we're going to still try to do them. Um, I think I may have told you that um, a, a gentleman delivered some concrete yeah. to yeah. our house the other day. Yeah. And, and we tipped him. And he was unbelievably grateful because he wasn't sure if he's going to have work right. the rest of the week. So those are the things that I'm, that I'm worried about that, and that, um, that I think in that one quadrant that we're all legitimately concerned about other people that can ride this through and go through, well, then we'll be fine. We'll be okay. Right. And we'll continue to invest and the world won't stop spinning and we will get back to work some way, somehow. Um, and we need to balance all these things is kind of my point. Yeah. We need to balance these tensions out. And I believe they're different in different places. Yeah. Well, they, so, they are. I mean, clearly, I mean, you're saying you're the difference between what you're describing in New Jersey and New York is definitely different than we're experiencing, even though we're under lockdown in the same way you are. I, I'm not sure if it's necessary. And that's not, I'm not going to talk about that. We're going to have a constitutional attorney talking about our rights and so on and so forth later down this week. And I'm going to be taking callers on that call, but i um, not here to talk about that today. And so, but places are different. I mean, we have a big country and New York and New Jersey are different than Idaho, different than Kansas, different than Texas, different than Washington, Oregon, California. And so, but the velocity of money, that's a great analogy because one person not having an income, well, you, you described five different places that it's going to affect and it's, that's exactly what happens. So let's get to the positive for a second. Yeah. Uh, if, if I can come back. Please. So, you know, what's going to come out of this? Yeah. Uh, a lot of innovation. Okay, different ways of communicating. Um, hopefully more business for some people in a, in a positive way that they're going to construct products and services uh, that is going to make life better or more manageable. Um, internet services, cyber businesses uh, to protect data and information. So if you're having more business meetings with more sensitive information being shared amongst uh, employees and partners and so forth. Um, how do you secure, you know, that data? Yeah. Um, is the uh, internet purchasing business going to, I think Amazon's doing well. Um, I know Lowe's is doing well. I think there's a construction company around here, supply company that said they're doing well because people are doing their home projects. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, look at what things are, have the potential to rebound. Um, and, and that is very, very important. And how do we transition um, parts of our economy that are not going to do so well or are at risk going forward? Uh, how do we create opportunity uh, for individuals and organizations and, and, and so forth? So uh, particularly in the service industry. Yeah. And so I, I'm optimistic if we, are able to grind our way through the hurdle and everybody is frustrated 
Um, everybody would like this to be different. Some of us get angry from time to time uh, and feel like our, our rights are, are, are being uh, infringed upon. And then you think about somebody that's working in an ICU or working at a hospital. And I think everybody, you know, we can do this. Uh, we can figure this out for a window of time, but there is a balance and a tension. Yeah. Um, and so, and there's a healthcare balance and tension. And, you know, if we're able to, I guess, flatten the curve is the term, uh, but get ahead of this a little bit and find ways to adapt. Uh, you're hearing comments on all levels of extreme that people want their state opened up and to be able to do whatever they want. You have other people talking about, we need to shut the economy down for 18 months. Um, you're hearing, hearing all kinds of, of commentary Right. Um, to me, the solution's in the middle somewhere. Sure. It, it's common sense, uh, uh, carefully uh, thought out, caring um, approach to how do we try to meet all these needs and get back to a, a normal way of living. And it's going to take some time, clearly. Uh, I'm not saying anything that, um, you know, that, that's not a new thought. Um, yeah. but I think it's a very uh, practical, pragmatic approach. Well, so, you know, Paul, one of the, that was great, great assessment. It is very pragmatic and I'm, I'm optimistic too. I mean, I, yeah, it's a challenge, but what that's, again, it's a, it's a reason I've always, always enjoyed being around Paul and he doesn't, he's never stuck in a victim box, you know, and, and I do, I do think that some people are using COVID-19 as an excuse, like to say why they can't do something. And obviously you guys know me, know that I don't use the word can't ever. I don't really want to use that term. And I think Paul's the same way. And I'm, I'm optimistic that something good is going to become of this, right? And one of the things that Paul has always talked about, oh, ever since I've met him for the last 20 years that we've known each other, is, is, a, is, a, is a fair exchange. And I'm going to relate that to one of the things he was talking to me about last week, how this will change how we do business. And even in the, maybe the capital asset business arena like that he's in and, and they sell to people like, that own businesses like me and analytical testing laboratory, um, bartering, fair exchange and bartering. Paul, I thought this was genius and I think this will happen. I think it's going to start happening and I like it. Can you describe what you think, not only for the common personal person with a car or a truck or maybe some small capital assets to a business with large capital assets, how bartering that you called it can change how we're going to be doing business in the future and, and why it will be changing. Uh, sure. Shane, thanks. Um, well, for, first off, I think we already barter. Uh, we just don't know we do it. Uh, and yeah. uh, I'll, I'll give you an example in a minute and just, uh, you know, and buying a new car, how that's bartered. But um, you had raised, I think, when I brought that up, some you know tax concerns, or isn't that illegal? And I, and, you know, and you know, bartering's not illegal at all. You barter all the time, and Absolutely. yeah, and whatever the tax code is, and whatever the responsibilities are there, you know, there's obviously responsibilities to uh, to honor those and obey the law. But we barter all the time. So, um, and I'll give you an example. So. Uh, you have a car and it's three years old and you want to go buy a new car. And let's just say the new car is $40,000 and the car that's three years old is now valued at $25,000. And you can do whatever you want with that car. But when you trade your car in, okay, you're not getting paid $25,000 and then paying back $40,000 you are paying the differential of $15,000 for the car and the tax associated with a $15,000 sale. So you just bartered your vehicle in exchange for another vehicle and some form of compensation to equalize the transaction. And we do that all the time. So I may be a um, mason contractor and I may, um, provide services uh, to a dentist in exchange for dental care or something of that sort. Sure. 
Um, and that's bartering. So to use an example of you and I, you may want to buy one machine that costs $300,000 and you may have two that you want to get rid of. So we might have a net transaction of, of $40,000 as an example. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I mean by bartering. Yeah. And, and I think bartering is important in this, in this con in this environment, because I think even maybe just one or two months or three months, whatever it is, cash flow is going to be affected negatively in businesses because of this. And so there's not going to be as much cash floating around to just buy um, outright a capital piece of equipment, for example. And so, but you might have other assets that you can trade or, or barter. And I think that's, that's a really good point, Paul. And I think that's probably going to be happening. And so what, what oper- that's an opportunity in this market. That's an opportunity of what we're finding now is when, when people may be cash poor, there's an opportunity for business models to go after that bartering type of market. And so I think that's a great, great opportunity. Is it something that you've thought about how you guys will change or do business or even market, I should say, market your business differently because of that potential bartering concept? Yeah, let me take a step back if I can. And I don't want to do a McKinley capital scientific commercial here, but one of the things we didn't touch on is uh, one of my partners retired about three years ago. And I don't know if you know Herb Lindsley or not, but Herb had his own capital company that we merged with McKinley Scientific to form McKinley Capital. Uh, And it greatly expanded our capability to service the market space um, to provide different types of financing vehicles for things within the scientific community and outside the scientific community into healthcare and media and broadcast and other other spaces that we had a skill set at. Um, the value of that is that you can begin to think a bit differently and a bit out of the box, and it may have application now in the midst of this crisis in our space. So, um, what all of us have to do is when, whenever you're doing anything that in, involves either finance or something that in, involves, you do risk assessment. Okay, you try to evaluate the risks and versus the opportunity. So one of the things that we've developed a skill set at is we believe that we can mitigate and understand the risks better in the scientific space than a more traditional type of financier or bank or capital company. And it gives us a strength. And it gives us the ability to then share that and help our clients and customers manage their space differently and more effectively and everybody wins. So it's an example of if a lab right now has things they like to do, but they might have a cash strap, there's a way to go in and look at assets, provide a financing mechanism, mitigate the risks and build a bridge and not dissimilar to what the government is doing right now with some of these SBA loans for this, the PPP program. So my point is, is less of a McKinley commercial, but more that adaptability, creating different ways of solving problems and thinking uh, within your strength and your skill set, what can I do differently to help people and to make our business uh, be, be healthy as well. Yeah. So, you know, the principle of that, what I think is gonna change a lot. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about here is, is you know, how do you build trust? H- how are you trustworthy? And that's gonna become increasingly important if we're not, if we're marketing differently, if we're not, uh, communicating in the same ways, if people aren't doing more face-to-face meetings and contacts, and it's already started, you know, with, sure. you know, we are doing business differently in a lot of places. A lot of people wouldn't have ordered a shirt over the internet and, and not go to a store to try it on first. And now we have systems in place that, all right, it's convenient to return it. So you, you will transact business that way. Okay. It makes sense. There's value to it. So the biggest thing is that you have to do something that's of high quality. Whatever it is that you do, you have to produce something that is of quality. It's viewed as valuable. And, and somebody would like to have that if they can. 
And then you have to do it with integrity. So you have to do it transparently with integrity and then it becomes repeatable. And then you are able to develop trust with your client base or with whoever you're working with. It doesn't even have to be business. And part of the process of doing that is to be educational and relational and less transactional, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the transactions will happen if you're skilled at the process of building trust and thinking in a relational way to what people need, what they want, uh, how, can, how you may have the ability to show uh, an organization a different way uh, to do something that they perhaps haven't considered. Uh, being a valued partner and being clear about what you're offering and what the risks and benefits are. Yeah. And that to me is central to how business is going to be changing. We all talk about it, but particularly with small companies, with the engine of our economy, which is small business, right. that the ability to develop that and to do it well is, is a critical step going forward. And, um, and I think there's a lot of people doing that, that are going to be able to do it. And so the mediums that we have offer us an opportunity. We just have to get better at them. Yeah, no, I, uh-huh. that, that is a great opportunity. And I, I think about that word trust and in, in all of our relationships, um, in, not only our personal relationships, but, but our business relationships, there has to be that trust. And, you know, it's, and that's one thing that I've really enjoyed working with McKinley um, about is that there's, there's just this level of trust that, you know, they're a small business as well. And so, you know, that they've got your back. And so it's just, it's, it's been a really, really great thing, Paul. And so that's really, really good advice. I really, really appreciate that. And so um, we're, we're getting towards the end. We talked about opportunity. You talked about a lot of things, adaptability, um, trust, um, reliability, um, repeatable. And so if you were to give a one, one minute snapshot of what your optimistic advice would be for businesses in this area and because of COVID-19, what would it be one minute snapshot? Um, if you need it, ask for help, uh, ask people to help. There's, there's a lot more help than you probably realize. Don't be afraid to do that. Um, weather the storm. Um, there's a, um, public speaker that I follow and he, you know, is one of his, uh, mantras, um, uh, E plus R equals O. And I'm like, you know, I didn't, didn't know what that meant. And what it really stands for is the event plus your response generally equals the outcome. So how we respond to what's going on right now, and you're going to have bad moments. You know, I sure as heck have. But as you do that, um, your outcome is going to change. It's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's, I, 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 we all need to be mentored. And I'm always... Uh, uh, looking for different people that I can connect with, identify with, uh, and be and be mentored by, and we all need to mentor. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do both at the same time, because everybody's in a different spot in their life at a different point in time. So uh, weather the storm. Okay, think about what you can do, what you can get done, um, and try to help others. It'll bring out the best in humanity right now. We're a great country. We have great resources. The biggest one of them is the people. And, you know, we can handle this. It's just a little frustrating right now and uncertain. And it's the uncertainty that creates the fear. Um, But we're on the other side of, of from worse to getting to better, in my opinion. Wow. That is, that is great advice. E plus R equals O event. By the way, I have to give credits. That person's name is Jim Stroker, by the way. So awesome. Go follow him. Speaker. Great. Go follow him on social media. E plus R equals O 
and that's your event plus the the your reaction yep. is going to be the the re, the reaction response is going to be the outcome and that that's how it's affected we've talked a lot about that in 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 past podcasts about effort and attitude that's all we can actually control is our effort and attitude this is very similar and but but paul as well talked about surround yourself with good people get a mentor and what i've found is I, I, I've been mentored by so many great people and I consider one of those to be Paul. And when I started mentoring myself and people started reaching out to me, it was like, it makes you even better. It's like, like obviously you can tell how Paul talks that he's obviously been a coach um, in baseball and basketball. So these are a lot, but that's, it's like, if I could go back, you probably feel the same way, Paul, once you've coached kids, for example, in baseball, if you could go back and, do the things that you told them to do when, with your own career, you'd probably be a professional star. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just great to also be a mentor, not only to be mentored. And so what great advice. So Paul, we're wrapping it up here and our theme is never be outworked on this secrets of success podcast. And one of the things that I've, I've, I've asked every guest to talk about is one of the biggest things in life that we have that I think that we deal with is, is having to persevere through difficult challenges. And this is one of them. COVID-19 is one of them. And I never like to call them failures, anything in life a failure. I always call it a learning event. And so, but some people externally or sometimes internally, we might even think, hey, that was a failure, but how did I turn it into a success? And so, Paul, I'm going to ask you to just reflect on your life and everything that's happened. And what would be one thing that people might look at or even you look at as Oh yeah, that was a failure, but it turned into success and there were, it, there were good things that became of it. Can you describe that? What would be that event in your life? Well, I mean, Shane, candidly, I've had lots of failures. <laughs> so I've had, I've been very blessed and that I've had lots of opportunities to learn. Yeah. Um, so uh, right, most of my, most of my failures, I would say are around immaturity and that I did not take advantage of some opportunities that were provided to me and didn't recognize them and maybe didn't honor them um, in a way that they deserved. And life's very efficient. So you, you know, you're in control of your actions, not necessarily the consequences. Yeah. And so I had, I've suffered the consequences of those types of mistakes, particularly when I was young. Interesting. Um, and, you know, once you own that and you kind of know it, then, you know, I think your determination comes into, into play that I'm going to learn from that and I'm not going to let that happen again. Um, and then you go on about your way and hopefully things worked out and they have, and then you'll make another mistake, <laughs> you know, and along the way you get better at it, hopefully. But I think that's just part of the process. I've often heard many people when I was younger say, gee, I wish I knew then what I know now, I would have done some things differently. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. I just, I, I think, uh, and I've had some big ups and downs, um, but it's been a, a great ride. Uh, I, you know, have part of the things that I've done very well have come out of some pretty big screw ups. Wow. And, you know, if you keep coming back to just to, you know, you try to do your best, um, and you're probably going to make some mistakes. If you're not making any mistakes, you're probably not having enough fun and you're not taking enough chances and utilizing the, the gifts that you were blessed with. That's right. Uh, yep. And so my advice to anybody would be is get some help and go for it. Yeah. That's you awesome. Know, that's awesome. That is, that is absolutely great advice, Paul. Thank you very much. We're wrapping it up here. You have been a fantastic guest. I'm, I'm glad you're healthy in New Jersey. I'm glad your crew is still moving forward. I'm thankful for your mentorship, your friendship, and all your business advice that you've ever, ever given me. So thank you very, very much, Paul. Stay tuned for episode number six on Thursday at 10 a.m. Going to live stream on Facebook where we're going to have a constitutional attorney talk about some of our rights and COVID-19. You don't want to miss this. We're going to take callers on that one. I already have four or five people that already want to call in. So it's going to be a really good interactive show. And thank you, Paul, very much. It's such an honor to have you on. And uh, of course, we'll talk very soon. And you have an awesome afternoon.
Shane, thank you, and the honor was mine. You are welcome. Thank Take you. care.